hi, American History. I'm going to test run this out and see how it goes. Uh, we are going to try to record me lecturing. Um, the assignment for today, Tuesday, is for you guys to um, just take notes and look over this PowerPoint about the culture of the 1950s because we kind of covered the pol excuse me, politics of the 1950s on Monday with the decoder with things about, you know, determination, self-determination, um, an iron curtain, stuff like that. So let's look at what's what's life like outside of wars in the 1950s. Um, so that's what we're going to look at here. At least we're going to get kind of far into it. Um, so let's go. Let's see what we can see here. Um, so we are going to start out uh, with the 1950s, right? Okay. Uh, so the important things, if you were to be taking notes along with me, is please write them down in red. If it's in red, write it down. I try to keep it pretty short for this guy. Um, but we got to look at the baby boomers. You guys have all heard of boomers, right? Um, so a baby boomer is just anyone who is born in this a time right after World War II. There was this huge baby boom, as you can see on this graph right here, um, in 1946, basically until 19, 1960. So it was 15 years after World War II. There was this huge baby boom. Um, and especially makes kind of sense, right? Because you got a soldier, you know, you're fighting overseas and you're girlfriend or your wife is at home and then you see her for the first time in three years and I mean you guys do the math boom nine months later baby happens so we see this huge baby boom um, during this time so the US population sort of balloons uh, in 1957 let's see if I can move my screen here so you guys can actually see it uh, there is a new baby born every seven seconds which is insane I mean we have children being born in this country at a rate that we've never actually seen before um, and then See here, school enrollments go way up as well, as you can see. Uh, we have uh, 19 by 1970, we have just huge amounts of school enrollments, obviously, because kids born in the 50s are going to school five, ten years later after that. Um, what else do we got here? Put this back down. Uh, so, so, the suburbs. You guys all live in a suburb. I live in a suburb. Um, of Denver, so main Denver, right? Think downtown Denver, right? You've got the, the tall buildings, the Pepsi Center, you got all that jazz. Um, well, all the areas surrounding Denver are, are known as suburbs, um, and they are just basically neighborhoods outside the city that are more spread out, um, and that is where people move during this time, especially white American families. They move out of the main cities and they go to the suburbs, places like we're talking about Denver, Westminster, uh, Littleton, Lakewood, Aurora, stuff like that. Those cities that surround Denver and are part of what we call the Denver metro area, but aren't actually Denver itself. Um, so this guy, uh, in 1949, again, right after World War II, he starts building these tiny houses that are like super attainable for the average person. Uh, and they are in this probably very familiar looking setup that you guys can see right here. It is a, uh, it's a suburb. It's, it's wide open spaces, everyone has a yard, you know, nice curly sort of streets. We're not talking about like the grid of the downtown area with apartments and really, really close houses and stuff like that. This is wide and spread out, but outside of the city. So suburbs really start growing up. You guys all live in a suburb. Highlands Ranch is a suburb. I live in Montbello, which while technically Denver is in, it's far away enough that it would be considered a suburb. Uh, this is the floor plan of what you can see one of these houses look like. It's very small by today's standards of a poor house, but... Um, by 1960, so just 15 years after the war, um, a third of the U.S. population has lived in the suburbs. And before the war, the suburbs really didn't even exist. They weren't a thing. So we can see there's this huge sort of trend towards this suburban living at the time. People are really moving out there. They want to move out there. Uh, again, shifts in, in population in the 1940s. We see there is just an absolute, uh, majorly, I guess you could say, uh, majority of people living in rural areas, areas outside of, you know, you know, the farm areas or, or places that are away from big cities. Um, and then the central cities hey, had the next largest and then suburbs were the, the lowest. And by 1950, we see that number start to creep up. By 1960, it's all pretty much about equal. And then by 1970, it's a huge majority. People just live in the suburbs. These are some famous examples of the suburbs. Uh, from television shows in the 1950s and 60s, the Donna Reed show, Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, Ozzy and Harriet show. These are all just shows that um, portrayed the average suburban family, um, which is, you know, the mom stays at home and cooks, the dad goes to work, kid gets into trouble, but he always learns his lesson at the end of the day when dad comes home and, you know, teaches them what's right and wrong. 
all that old stereotype there was really how people lived. Ooh, this is fun with introduction of credit. Really quickly, briefly, I'm going to run you guys through the difference between a credit and a debit card. So a credit card, oh, sorry, we'll start with the easier one. A debit card is a card that is basically just like paper, like a plastic money. You have $700 in your bank account and you have a debit card. Well, that debit card swipes and it just pulls from that $700 that you have in your bank account. So once your bank account's empty, your debit card's useless. It's essentially just like a plastic version of the cash that you have in the bank. A credit card's different. Also, plastic looks exactly like a debit card, but a credit card um, lets you borrow money. Borrow money from a bank or from whatever institution makes that credit card. And then what happens is that means that even if you don't have the cash, let's say I want to buy a Nintendo Switch, which is like $300, um, and I only have $75 in my bank account, but I have a credit card. Well, I can pay with the credit card. It instantly gives me the $300. But then I have to pay back that $300 later to the credit card company, usually with interest, which means if if I had a 20% interest on my credit card, let's say. Um, so that's 20% of 300 is $60, which means in order to pay back that credit, card debt. I don't just have to pay the 300 I spent on the switch. I have to pay 20% in interest as well, which means I would end up paying $360 for it. So it's convenient. You can buy things when you don't have the money for them, but you pay back for it at the end. But credit becomes a huge thing here in the 1950s. The first credit card was called the diner's card. And you can see here that if you look at the, the map here, or the, um, sorry, the graph that just credit usage soars because people want stuff and sometimes they can't always afford stuff. Again, consumerism, people are buying stuff. It's the 1950s. People want things, uh, especially after that World War, Great Depression time and World War II time where everyone was saving, everyone was rationing. Now you don't have to do those things. You can buy as much as you want. So people kind of people kind of go nuts with it just a little bit. Um, we are stopping or ceasing our work in factories. We remember World War II, that's all we did. We built stuff. We built planes, we built you know, parachutes, we built, you name it, we built it. We built half of the stuff in the world. But by 1960, 1957, um, factory workers really started losing their jobs. Um, there were more what we call white collar than blue collar jobs in the US. White collar is like, imagine like you could wear a white button up shirt to that job. That's a white collar job. It's so like a teacher, salesman, uh, dentist, whatever it is, you know, a job that is more, uh, less focused on hard labor. You can't wear a white shirt, a white button-up shirt to a factory job because it's going to get ruined. Those are the blue-collar jobs. Things like, you know, like plumbers, electricians, factory workers, stuff like that. So we saw more white-collar jobs than blue-collar jobs in the U.S. And that's a huge change from the World War II era where we were making stuff like crazy. Um, corporate consolidation, basically 600 corporations. Um, half of all the U.S. companies accounted for 53% of total corporate income. Essentially what that means is that we have very few companies owning the majority of the wealth, which is honestly not that different than how it is right now. Um, but why is that happening? Why isn't it more equitable? Why don't the small companies have more wealth as well? Well, because the Cold War military buildup, because we have, we were at Cold War with the Soviet Union and we're trying to fight them and we're trying to build up our nuclear stockpile. Um, we need big companies in order to do that. So these, these companies get government contracts to build, you know, nuclear bombs and defense systems and planes and stuff like that, and they get very, very rich because of it. Okay, so one of the reasons why people are able to actually live in the suburbs during this time, and here, I'll put this right here, is the car. The car becomes totally ubiquitous. Everybody gets a car by the 50s. Two car families double. Usually it was just the family car. Well, now there's two cars. The, the husband and the wife has a car. Maybe they passed down one of those cars to the kids. Um, and of course, the cars looked absolutely ridiculous, but, but awesome. Like, look at that pink Cadillac or the Chevy Corvette. Those are classic looking cars. They look phenomenal, but um, maybe a little ridiculous for the times. Um, and then one of the main reasons that suburbs become so viable during this time and uh, why cars become so popular is because in 1956, the Interstate Highway Act, the largest public works project in American history happens. President Dwight Eisenhower puts it through. And essentially what happens is if you guys have ever driven on a road that starts with the letter I, I-25, I-70, I-225, I-270, uh, any of that, 
you've driven on an interstate on a freeway. Now, these are completely normal for us. They're just part of our lives. But at the time, this was revolutionary. It allowed people to quickly get from the city center, think about downtown Denver, to Highlands Ranch. How would you get there? Well, you'd probably take I-25. You wouldn't take surface streets all the way down. I mean, you could take, like, Colorado all the way down, but, you know, you'd have traffic lights. It'd take forever. It'd be inconvenient. So you take I-25. I'm sure there's traffic on it, especially now, but it's still faster. It's an uninterrupted strip of road taking you out from the city to wherever you need to go. Same thing with I-70. If you're trying to go up to the mountains, well, you hook up to I-70, you just shoot right up there. So this allows people to travel longer distances more quickly, which is crazy useful. Um, it allows people to live farther away from where they work. I'm proof that that works, right? I live over 20 miles from my job, and I take three ways to get to work every single day. Well, not now. I wake up and roll out of bed to get to work, but hey, that's all of us right now. Um, so it's this revolutionary um, idea that allows travel and allows basically populations to spread out further. Instead of being concentrated in a city, now we have populations moving all over, moving left, right, north, south, east, west, um, which is why you get a, a metro area like Denver's, right, which has Denver itself. Um, oh, gosh. But then, you know, you'll have like down oh, down here, you have Highlands Ranch, and then up here uh, where I live in Montbello, and then you have like uh, Broomfield, and then you have Thornton right here, and then all over, you know, you have all these different urban settlements. <sighs> We're making the thread. Also a good point, too. America does become more homogenous. Uh, basically what that means is individual places look less unique because of the automobile. Um, when you can drive anywhere, you start getting national franchises, things like McDonald's. You get McDonald's all over the country. So here is what I am going to do. I'm going to attach a link to this as well because I'd like you to just play this game for 10 minutes. This is where we're going to stop with the notes and the lecture and the stuff for today. Is I would like you guys to go to um, a link. Uh, it's a game. It's called GeoGuessr. And what it does is it plops you on a Google Street View just somewhere. You can do the world or you can do the United States. I'm going to encourage you guys to do the United States version. Um, so go there, play the U.S. version. And what's going to happen is it's just going to drop you on a Google street view somewhere in the United States. You can look around, you can move around a little bit, but you have to guess on the map where you are in the United States. And it's a lot harder than you might think it is. Um, you're going to find yourself looking more at, at, at trees, at foliage, at, at sort of the nature, than you are going to be looking at buildings. Because with the car, with franchises, you know, a Taco Bell in Duluth, Minnesota looks exactly the same as a Taco Bell in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They look the same because it the car has allowed us to move around, has allowed these franchises to sort of grow. The interstates have helped us as well. Um, and the United States has kind of become placeless. You know, there isn't a lot of unique identifiers to a place besides maybe its terrain. Maybe it's, it's you know, it's plants and it's animals and stuff like that. So um, pop on a GeoGuessr, play a game. Um, and then what I'm going to ask everyone to do is I'm going to attach a Google Doc to this. Please attach the score that you've got on your GeoGuessr. Um, generally, the lower the score, the better, because that's how many miles away you were from your five guesses. So take a shot at it, guys. See what happens. Um, thank you for tagging along with this. This is all we have for Tuesday. Um, I'm going to continue this on Friday. I'm going to lecture a little bit more. Uh, and we might even play with uh, the the nuke map a little bit, or I'll have you guys play with the nuke map, which is a fun tool to sort of visualize just how destructive nuclear bombs are. Um, so thank you so much for now, guys. That was, that was a lot of fun for me. This is the first time I've tried to lecture via the internet, so it's kind of cool. Uh, thanks for tuning in, um, and I will see you guys on Friday. Thank you so much.